To recap the series, in part 1, I presented my particular motto of God. Then, in part 2, I presented a case for why the intrinsic probability of theism is higher than that of naturalism. And in my last video, I presented a cumulative argument that shows how theism, in many respects, has more explanatory power than naturalism. In this video, I want to tackle the most important objections to the theistic hypothesis. At the end of my previous video, I discussed how there is evidence against theism that needs to be taken into account. Naturalists will argue that the evidence from evil and divine hiddenness are strong enough to tip the favors in favor of naturalism against theism. And so, if theism faces these anomalies, and if theism is not able to address them, then the evidence from evil would serve as a falsification of the theistic hypothesis, in the sense that theism is not able to account for it in the proper way. The same line of reasoning applies to divine hiddenness and other contemporary objections to the theistic hypothesis. As we closed off in the previous video, often within science as well as metaphysics, a lot of theories will have what is termed an anomaly. Anomalies are evidential difficulties that reflect differences between the observed evidence we see in the world and theoretically expected data that is predicted from a theory. I would say that there are anomalies that face theism as well. These anomalies come within the various forms of the problem of evil as well as the objections regarding divine hiddenness. I believe that these anomalies can be solved when we take into account the explanatory flexibility of theism. And so, that will be the focus of this video. This video serves as a sequel to the previous video in that we can extend the explanatory power of theism into the explanatory flexibility of theism. However, in order to understand how theism can account for its anomalies, we must step back and examine the nature of explanatory flexibility. My main goal will be in showing in how theism has the explanatory flexibility to account for for evil and divine hiddenness without any ad hoc viciousness. Furthermore, my goal in this video is strictly about metatheodicizing and not about comparing theism with naturalism in regards to evil. I will get into the, to the comparisons in my next video as the work of Paul Draper and Graham Oppy are about doing comparisons with theism and naturalism. However, this video is mainly about defending theism against the problem of evil and divine hiddenness and arguing that theism is not an ad hoc theory when responding to these problems. Finally, I want to make it clear to my audience that this video was not easy to make. Unlike my previous videos, it took me a lot of time to think on what I have to say on this subject. And so, I cannot guarantee that the things that I will say in this video are going to be able to convince people that I have solved the problem of evil. I do not claim that my solution to this problem will be persuasive to everyone watching. So I encourage viewers to keep in mind the principle of charity with what I will have to say in this video. With that in mind, let's begin. To begin our investigation, we must first have a solid understanding about the nature of ideal explanatory flexibility. I went over in a previous video about the nature of explanation, and how an explanation of a certain phenomena will require different substances. For more details on this, I would encourage viewers to please watch my previous video because I go over the different types of explanations and go into great depth about how theism serves as an explanation of the world. And so, that brings us to ideal explanatory flexibility. Ideal explanatory flexibility negotiates between two extreme, undesirable properties possessed by bad models or theories. The first of these extremes, regarding bad theories, is a theory that is extremely hostile towards modification. This is a theory which dogmatically maintains its commitments about the world, even in the face of strong contradictory evidence. Such a theory is unresponsive to evidence because it is unable to be extended to account for new data that contradicts its core commitments. The second extreme regarding a bad theory is a theory that is so flexible that it becomes ad hoc. A theory that incorporates every single piece of contradictory evidence into its program by interpreting that evidence in an ad hoc fashion to give the deceptive appearance that the theory's predictions have been fulfilled is a theory that is not properly flexible.
Such a model or theory is also unresponsive to evidence, because there is no conceivable input of evidence that will alter the model's theoretical output. A theory with too much flexibility is a theory which has the theoretical viciousness of being ad hoc. The theoretical viciousness of ad hoc theories means that an ad hoc theories are just ones which add assumptions and so diminish the probability of the overall conjunctive hypothesis. Hence, when judging the simplicity of certain models, philosophers of science have sought to minimize the number of free parameters or free assumptions. This means that theories should not have to artificially specify parameter values or add extra assumptions, where these assumptions are not derivable from the other contents within the hypothesis. Now, the name that properly characterizes these bad models of the world, or models that are not ideally flexible, are models that are termed unfalsifiable. A model that has ideal explanatory flexibility is a model that negotiates between these two extremes and meets the demand for it to be responsive to evidence. A model which has ideal explanatory flexibility is a model that does not blindly ignore contradictory evidence, nor does it try to recontextualize its contradictory evidence in an ad hoc fashion. Such a model would respond to contradictory evidence either by recontextualizing its own contents and commitments to accommodate new evidence, via the process called paradigm shifting, or being thrown on altogether through the process called falsification. Now, with paradigm shifting, this is often how knowledge is gained within scientific study. A few hundred years ago, our main understanding of physics was through Newtonian mechanics. Now, our most advanced understanding of the world is done through quantum mechanics and general relativity. The theories we hold today within science are done because of paradigm shifting. It is done because our models were able to accommodate new evidence and so it expanded our total body of knowledge. This leads to more comprehensive theories that explain more data, and this is what leads us to our most advanced scientific theories. This was done because scientists would maintain their theories in the face of anomalies or apparent contradictory evidence. It's what allows us to further develop our theories of the world, and these developments will oftentimes overcome the anomalies that theories face. Of course, one has to be careful, because if the theory is ad hoc, then it should be thrown out altogether. With this in mind then, ideal explanatory flexibility within science also explains how science has research projects. If a model is good at ideal explanatory flexibility, then it could be a research project since it is able to grow our body of knowledge. With this in mind, we should also take into account what an anomaly is. As we stated before, an anomaly is an evidential difficulty that faces a theory. Now, there are two types of anomalies. The first type of anomaly is a weak anomaly, and the second type is a strong anomaly. As an example, if our theory says that all ravens are black, then an apparent raven that looks non-black is a strong anomaly, and an apparent raven that fails to look black is a weak anomaly. The difference is that in the first example, we have clear evidence of a non-black raven, while in the second example, we only have a raven that fails to look black. But of course, failing to look black is not a strong anomaly of the theory. An anomaly serves as contradictory evidence to a theory, and so a theory must be able to respond to this evidence without being too flexible, aka ad hoc. As an example, let's consider naturalistic evolution. According to evolution, all currently extended non-domesticated species on Earth gradually developed from a unicellular ancestor by random mutation under selection pressures. However, over a million non-domesticated multicellular extended species have been identified. There are examples where non-domesticated species will not be the product of a gradual chain of random mutations. However, such examples such as multicellular life do not disconfirm evolutionary theory. The same applies for many scientific theories that entail non-trivial universal generalizations about a large number of observations about the world and yet there can be counterexamples to such theories. With anomalies, it does not matter how much evidence there is for a theory. The precession of the orbits of Mercury is an anomaly for Newtonian physics regardless of how much evidence there is for Newtonian physics. The precession is still an anomaly for the theory and is what led us to eventually adopt general relativity.
However, with anomalies, we must also avoid what is called anomaly mongering. For example, I can make the claim that the table in front of me appears as if it has no vacuum in it. However, science tells us that all physical objects, including my table, are made of mostly empty vacuum. The mere appearance that it is not a vacuum does not at all disconfirm the scientific evidence of atomic theory. And so the mere fact that theories are subject to anomalies is unsurprising within science. If there were no anomalies that existed within a theory, then the theory may more likely turn out to be ad hoc. And so criticizing a theory by pointing out that there are anomalies for the theory is merely anomaly mongering, and it does not at all disprove the theory or show why sh we should reject it. And so, even if there is some data which is surprising on one hypothesis over another, the mere fact that it is surprising is not at all evidence that requires the theory be abandoned. So in summary, ideal explanatory flexibility simply constrains the theory so that it does not become ad hoc in light of new or surprising data. And so, when it comes to how theism responds to the evidence from evil, there must be things derivable from God's nature that allows us to expect that God would create a world with the types of evils and suffering that we see in this world. And so that will be the goal of this video, and I will begin with some general considerations. If there is a God, then he would only do the best kind of actions or among the equal best kind of actions. In my previous video, I went over this in more detail. But in summary, God is constrained by his nature to only create the worlds with the most value. Worlds with this value are worlds that are relatively similar to God's own nature and God's own value. If God is a moral agent, then God would desire and value moral beings which do the good. God is also said to have perfect freedom, and for the nature of God, perfect freedom means freedom from all non-rational influences. However, I argued in my video that God would give us the ability to choose freely whether or not to love God or something else. Humans have the ability to choose God and to form their own characters, so that they come to love him naturally. If God decided to make all creatures from the start free from irrational influences, then they could not freely reject God. And so, God created beings which have the ability to freely reject God, and hence beings which have irrational influences. It would be a very special kind of goodness, where God would be creating a kind of freedom of choice that God does not possess himself, because God cannot choose to do evil. We will get more into the nature of evil and freedom, but before we could even get into that, we must ask, what does theism entail when it comes to creation? In order to address this question, we must first avoid two extreme positions that have traditionally occupied this topic. The first of these extremes is the skeptic. The skeptical person says that no one could ever be justified in knowing why God allows for evils, and likewise, we could never know what worlds God is most likely to create since we cannot know God's intentions for anything. My last video was in response to this extreme skepticism, where we can actually know or have some idea of the intentions that God has given the nature of God. The second extreme, however, is the dogmatic person. They will say that they can see every single reason for why God would allow for evil, and they know all of God's reasons and intentions. So when they don't know a reason for why there are certain evils, then there is probably no reason for certain evils or purpose for certain evils. However, I believe that this stance is just as problematic as the skeptical one, and so my approach is to be more moderate about the intentions of God. And so, when it comes to the problem of evil and the problem of divine hiddenness, we should take a moderate perspective on understanding God's intentions. In the first video of this series, I argued that God is absolute perfection. And so, does God as absolute perfection entail a perfect world? To help us think about this question, let's first suppose that this perfect God did not create anything. Would anything of value be missing if God didn't create anything? Well, in a sense, yes. First, is that a perfect world is not a perfect being, and so a maximally great world is not identical to a maximally great being. God, being maximally valuable, does not entail or is not the same as all value. God would have maximal value in the sense that it's 
all the value that a being could have, but the best kind of possible world would have all possible values. For example, if we consider that there is a maximum being that exists alone, then this would not be a variety of things. There would be no opportunities for exploration and scientific discoveries, and no evolutionary progress. In other words, God being absolute perfection and absolute value does not entail that God has to have all values, but rather, the things which can have all values are those found in the best possible worlds. And since God will create the best kinds of worlds, then it follows that God will create worlds which contain all values, even if those values that God himself does not have. And so it follows that the worlds with the most values are going to be the worlds that God creates not for necessitating reasons, but because it is within God's nature to actualize worlds which have all values. And so, the explanatory flexibility of theism will be in terms of certain values. So if there is anything that requires God to do an overall bad action, then this would falsify theism as a hypothesis, since God can only do the best kind of actions and actualize the best kinds of worlds. Another implication of this is that under theism, since God will actualize worlds which have the greatest values, he would also be able to grasp values that are beyond what any limited mind can comprehend. So even if we don't have any knowledge of the perfect reason why God allows for different classes of evil, that does not falsify the theistic hypothesis. And as we explained before, criticizing a theory by merely pointing out that there are anomalies for the theory is merely anomaly mongering, and it does not at all disprove the theory or show why we should reject it. So even if there is some data which is surprising on theism when it comes to certain specific facts about evil, the mere fact that it is, it is surprising is not at all evidence that requires the theory be abandoned. In other words, we do not have to take a dogmatic stance in terms of God's intentions for allowing certain evils. By the logic of theism, there will be certain values that God sees that we may not be able to comprehend at this point in time. And so merely pointing out the fact that there are things which are surprising on theism, given our limited knowledge, does not at all falsify theism. However, we should also, and we don't want to take the skeptical stance, where we cannot know any reasons for why God allows for evils. Otherwise, if we have no idea about why God allows for evils, then there is nothing that stops us from claiming that we cannot know the types of worlds that God creates. So my approach to the problem of evil, it does not take a skeptical or dogmatic stance, but rather, I approach it from an ideal flexibility sense. Approaching the problem of evil like this allows us to further expand our body of knowledge about why God allows certain evils, and why God created our type of world. With this in mind, let's begin our theodicy. An important objection to theism would be that if God exists and is all-knowing, then by definition he could imagine any number of universes, each with its own earth and population and the same people making different decisions in each possible world. If God has an infinite mind, then he could imagine a universe where everything turns out exactly as he wants. In other words, God could create a universe in which everyone just so happens to use their free will to make the right decisions. And if God is all-powerful, then he could create such a universe. However, we do not live in such a universe, because our universe includes a lot of evil and suffering, as humanity made the wrong decisions from the beginning, which led to thousands of years of bloodshed and millions of years of evolutionary evils. The argument is that the best possible world would be a world where everyone just so happens to freely choose the good and be with God. The atheist philosopher J.L. Mackey put the problem like this, Quote, if God has made men such that in their free choice they sometimes prefer what is good and sometimes what is evil, why could he have not made such men that they always freely choose the good? If there is no logical impossibility in a man's freely choosing the good in one or in several occasions, then there cannot be a logical impossibility in his freely choosing the good on every occasion. God was not, then, faced with the choice between making an innocent autonoma and making beings who, in acting freely, would sometimes go wrong. There was open to him the obviously better possibility of making beings who would act freely but always go right. 
Clearly, his failure to avail himself of this possibility is inconsistent with his being both omnipotent and wholly good. End quote. With this objection in mind, we already know that the theistic hypothesis entails that God will create the best possible world or among the equal best kinds of worlds. Understanding this, we can point out several issues with Mackey's argument. First, is that it assumes that to bring about the best kind of world, that God is required to set in motion every single event, and that God set in motion that which it will inevitably produce, so that everyone would freely choose the good from the start. But this is not going to produce a genuine state of affairs, since everything is determined by God, and so the choices of agents are not genuine enough to be free. God would have to be directly involved in determining the nature of every individual human being so that they will inevitably choose God. But this is not genuine freedom. What I mean by genuine freedom has to do more specifically with the nature of freedom itself. So with the nature of evil and freedom, there are three important things we need to take into consideration. The first would be theistic determination. When God creates a world, he can either strongly or weakly actualize the state of affairs. No world would exist unless God actualized it. However, the state of affairs that happen in that world are produced by second order causes, aka causes that are not directly controlled by God. I argued in a previous video that God would create beings which have bodies and can influence their environment with or acquire their powers through limited, unchosen power, knowledge, and desires that are received from their environment. And then they choose whether to extend that power and knowledge and improve those desires or to not bother. I will say more on this when I discuss autonomous creation. But the first consideration is that creation would be able to evolve on its own without constant divine intervention. It is a special kind of act where God creates a world that is not divinely determined. And so the identity of human persons are much more dependent on the processes of creation itself rather than the, the divine act of God. Created things will play a much more significant role in the shape of individuals if they are autonomous to some extent. And the autonomous process of creation was not divinely determined as creation is allowed to evolve on its own. Now, why would God create an autonomous creation? I will explore that more in the next part of the video. But for now, I am only focusing on the general considerations. The second consideration for the nature of freedom is about self-determination. The nature of free will is not that you have alternative possibilities. The agent is the one who directs us of any action they commit. As a thought experiment, let's say that there is a man with a bomb attached to him and the bomb is set off to go if he makes a certain set of decisions. And let's say the man ends up surviving and making it to the end of the day, because the decision that the programmer had set for the bomb to go off, the man wasn't going to make those decisions anyways. In this case, the man is free even if there are no alternative possibilities because the action was self-directed. Another example is let's say that an angel took over my body, and so I only act in accordance with goodness. And let's say that I am totally free from irrational influences because I only act in accordance with goodness. However, it would not be me that is flourishing because the angel is using my body. And so, in order for there to be freedom, the self has to be there and have the self determine the actions. Only then can I be free from irrational influences in a genuine way. The final consideration on the nature of freedom is about flourishing. Someone who is in a state of irrational influences is not free because they are not following the dictates of goodness and reason. So one can only be flourishing if they are totally free from irrational influences, and this requires that they morally grow into their own virtuous characters without being constrained. Flourishing is simply a consequence of theistic determination and self-determination. With these three considerations in mind, if we accept the conclusion that God could create a world in which everyone freely chooses to do the good, then the solutions to Mackey's dilemma would have to come from the initial world that God created. First, is that God himself must create a world with maximum genuineness to create a world with all compossible values. This includes values such as the ability to respond to evils and to grow in virtue in light of those evils. 
Agents in a world where everyone just so happens to freely choose the good are going to have moral perfection and experience the goodness of God, where there are only some decisions that result from irrational influences, but who make it through the evils, will be able to experience not only the goodness of gods, but also experience evil, and yet choose to love God despite that evil. In other words, the people in the world in which there are irrational influences that gave them the ability to freely reject God through their irrational influences, and yet still chose to accept God as the good despite those irrational influences, will be the world with all compossible values, or all possible values that can logically exist in such a world. So in order to bring about all logically possible values, or all compassible values, there must be a maximum range of good and evil that God will allow, so that people can have genuine choice to accept God or to reject God. The implication of this is that the greatest evil that could happen in any possible world is that someone eternally rejects God. Under theism, if God is the good, then the most evil action would be the rejection of God. This good is the acceptance of God. In between those two options lies the total range of good and evil actions that humans can commit. And between those options lies certain degrees of irrational influences. God allows those irrational influences to play out so that people can generally choose God without being directly designed by God to do so. This allows for all possible values to exist. With that in mind, if God does not allow someone, if they are evil, to con continuously choose evil actions, then their actions are not genuine. For example, if someone continually chooses, like a domino effect, to pervert their good, and if God stops them in some arbitrary sense, he creates a world in which there are already limitations of mind, and so genuineness would be limited, and thus certain values would be limited. Limiting values like this makes it where there cannot be all compossible values. Thus, God must not limit the range of good of evil that takes place. So in summary, if God is to create the best kind of possible world, then there would need to be a maximum range of good and evil in order to bring about all compossible values. The maximum evil that could take place is when someone freely chooses to eternally separate themselves from God. God must allow this option in order to make any decisions actually genuine, and so the creative process of God must be autonomous and genuine as well. This implies that in order for true, genuine freedom to exist, there must be three conditions. First, is that there cannot be any influences from God that determine someone's nature. So someone's nature, or unchosen powers and desires, would be determined by things that are already created through an autonomous process, and not through God himself. More on this later. Second, there must be genuine self-determination in which there are no influences beyond the person, and that the person is the ultimate decider in the actions of the person. And third, is that there must be flourishing. However, for flourishing to take place, there cannot be irrational influences, and so to get rid of irrational influences, there must be some kind of soul building and moral development. I will talk more about soul building later in this video, but a different summary would be this. God's created process is autonomous, and not from God directly. While God is responsible for creation, the actual events of creation are indeterministic events that are not directly affected by God. This autonomous creation will produce free agents which have limited irrational influences, and the limits of those irrational influences extend all the way into the most evil things that any being could do, which is the total and eternal rejection of God. And so, these agents have the self-determination to accept God or to reject God eternally. The rejection of God is only possible due to these irrational influences, and it would not be possible for any creature to reject God if they were not given irrational influences through autonomous creation. Now, of course, there is a lot more that could be said on this, but again, these are just the general considerations, and I will get more into the details later in this video. So, to summarize, I went over how we should not be skeptical or dogmatic about what God's intentions are in respect to evils. And so, building off my previous video, we are, better, we are able to better narrow down the range of worlds that God is most likely to bring about.
God must create the best kinds of worlds. The best kinds of worlds will be worlds which have all values. Now some may argue that it is logically impossible for there to be a world with all values. However, being logically impossible is not something that is valuable. And so, it follows by reason that God will create a world which has all the values that can logically in exist in the same world. From here, we can see that there is value in a world where there can be certain virtues that grow in response to evils. There is goodness in the fact of there existing in actual and genuine states of affairs where it's possible for people to freely and genuinely accept or reject God. There is value in the defeat of evil that everyone can participate in. There is value in a world that evolves on its own without the need for constant divine intervention. While I will say more on about these considerations in a moment, an important aspect of this general consideration is what I will term, say, making theodicy, where the virtues of saints will be in response to the evils of the world and that we can all participate in the defeat of evils. And so, with the value of sainthood and the defeating of evil, we can see that the greatest sainthood requires very significant trials. And the very significant trials require a world in which there are no restrictions on good or evil that can take place. It is logically impossible to have true courage without danger, to have true generosity without a lack of resources, to have true heroism without someone that needs a hero. These sorts of valuable virtues cannot exist without their first being initial evils. And so, this narrows down the range of worlds that God is most likely to create, since if there are worlds that have a maximum range of good and evil, and if those worlds contain more values than a world without that range, then it follows by reason that God would not create a world in which everyone just happens to freely choose the good. But God would create a world which has actual evil that saints must overcome and defeat. So a world in which evil exists must be defeated is a better world than a world in which evil never exists. And so, this will be our response to Mackey's dilemma for now. There are a lot of other considerations to take into account, such as the problem of heaven. But first, we will begin with addressing the nature of creation and natural evils. To begin, it is important to first examine the types of worlds that God could create. When God is given the option to create any universe with a certain nature, they would need to narrow down what type of natural world God would create given God's nature. So this requires that we examine our philosophy of nature. Philosophy of nature asks us about what is nature fundamentally. Here are two options. One. Nature is a blind and mindless machine that strictly obeys physical laws. And two, nature is a cognitive and mental process that has intelligence built into it. Now, of course, one may initially think that answering this question is irrelevant to the problem of evil. But I believe this helps to set up the initial stage of what we see in creation. If God has to create the worlds with the most values, then that also includes the values that are developed through the creative order itself. The values must extend to all of creation and how it functions. Creation is thought to obey rules or physical laws mindlessly and strictly. The philosophy of nature we assume is that the universe is mindless and only obeys physical laws without any purpose or goal. However, my view is to take the second option, that nature is a cognitive and mental process that has intelligence built into it. Taking this approach on the philosophy of nature bypasses a lot of issues. God sustains a universe that has cognition already built into it. This implies that the universe itself is in some sense conscious. If nature does have intelligence and consciousness built into it, then in some sense there can be cosmic soul building. If God created a conscious universe, then it can be consistent with the idea that creation has to go through a long causal history. God has endowed with creation the ability to make itself, via indeterministic and chanty processes. Just as God created humans with indeterministic and chanty processes so that we can make free will decisions, so too the universe would run through these same indeterministic principles. Where just like humans can build their own characters, 
creation can also build up its own chanty processes. And so, it is my view that God created a universe that is conscious and therefore can evolve intelligently on its own is more likely than God created a mindless universe that requires constant divine intervention, as there are more compossible values that can be developed through a conscious universe. It would explain why we live in a dynamic universe, and why evolution happens through adaptions to perpetuations and environmental challenges. It's as if it's an enormous good that God's innate creation, just like inanimate creation, undergoes stress and challenges like humans do so that it can become better, refined, and more equipped, and that there is a long causal process that involves billions of years. Think about how stars form. The supernovas that send their material throughout the universe and that they can collect and undergo nuclear fusion is a harsh and energetic process. It seems to me, prima facie, that if that's the underlying principle that makes sense of all of creation, then it makes sense as to why we live in the type of universe that we do. Furthermore, consider the fact that it is a very special kind of goodness where God would be creating a kind of freedom of choice in humans that God does not possess himself. In a similar way, that there is a special kind of goodness where God would be creating a universe that allows itself to be sufficiently distinct from God and thereby a recipient of God's love. And just like for humans, there would need to be genuine freedom to make genuine choices, it is also a special kind of act where God creates a world that is not divinely determined and can itself have genuine freedom. The value of a self-actualizing conscious universe via random processes is the same value that humans are endowed with when they have the ability to form their own moral characters through the history of free choices. Another reason to believe that there is more value in an autonomous creation is the fact that evolution allows for deep interconnections between entities within creation. Even if we cannot fully explicitate or explain why the interconnectedness is valuable, we do have good reasons to think that they are valuable given common human practices. It is valuable when adopted children look for their biological parents, and it is valuable when people spend time trying to determine their family tree. Human-to-human -human ancestral connections with their past culture seems to be valued by humans. As Josh Rasmussen says, Randomness allows creation to enjoy more of a co-creational role in producing species, thereby strengthening the connectivity of its creatures. To see this, suppose that God determines everything in the natural world by creating its initial conditions, plus certain laws that guarantee each preceding detail of the cosmos. In this scenario, God is the ultimate, sufficient reason for every natural event in the cosmos in the sense that every natural event is either directly brought about by God or determined by that which God directly brings about. But now my connection to the cosmos is diminished. After all, the cosmos has not exercised any causal powers of its own that contributes to who I am. Contrast this scenario with an autonomous creation that contains genuine torrents of randomness. In this picture, the universe has the inherent ability to unravel in several different ways. Since God does not directly or indirectly select each event in the cosmos, and since the cosmos has its own contra-causal capabilities, creatures can rightly say, I am who I am in part because the universe has made me such. To further draw out the role of randomness, it may help to consider an analogy from divine providence and human freedom. Suppose that theological determinism is true, and thus God is the sufficient cause of all events and actions in the world. Thus God, deliberately and without constraint, establishes the causal connections that inevitably lead to all events and actions. A common worry about this picture of providence is that it robs humans of their freedom, since they cannot meaningfully be said to be the ultimate source, the sufficient reason for any of their actions. At most, they are the proximate cause of their actions. The ultimate explanation of each and every action is the unconditioned decree of God. Ultimately, God planned and set into motion that which will inevitably produce that particular personal or psychological identity. Consequently, one only looks at one's biological ancestry as merely the path used to ex execute God's plan. Contrast this scenario, however, with the autonomous and deterministic creation. Now, the spontaneous interworking of creation makes one's personal and or psychological identity much more dependent on the processes of creation itself, 
such that one would not be the one who or what one is without the radically contingent outcomes of these processes. Created things, therefore, play a more sufficient role in shaping individuals if they are autonomous to some extent. This greater role enhances the significance of one's connections to the cosmos and its contents. And so, an autonomous creation has more value than a deterministic one, and hence, God would actualize an autonomous creation that can evolve on its own. This helps to explain why God would have to create a universe with a long causal history to it. An autonomous creation predicts a long causal history, as the development takes time through a series of physical processes. Furthermore, if nature is fundamentally mental and intelligent, then humans would need to go through soul building to form their own characters. So too, creation would also go through a sort of cosmic soul building to generate its values and respond to its own pressures. The end game for creation then would be an eternal paradise that is similar to the traditional version of heaven. So the final state of creation would be an improvement of the actually logical goods that resulted from random based processes. The mental capacities of the universe mediate between value facts and cosmological facts. The universe itself evolves in response to considerations of value, as it is conscious of those values in some capacity. So in summary, since there are more compossible values in a conscious universe than an unconscious one, then it follows that God would create a conscious universe. The conscious universe must then, in some sense, be aware of the consequences of its actions. And as the universe goes through its stages, it slowly learns what is the right path to take. The universe goes through cosmic soul building to learn about the right actions to take in its development until it eventually reaches a perfected state. And so now that we have laid the framework for why an autonomous creation would be a prediction of theism, then this helps to set up the background by which we respond to the different arguments from evil. I will now begin with natural evils. Since autonomous creation is a prediction of theism, then this would include the natural world and its processes. However, for natural evils, there are only natural evils if there are moral agents involved. We don't say, for example, that Jupiter has any natural evils. Even though the planet Jupiter has endless storms, there are no moral agents that it is affecting, and so no one would argue that the natural processes of Jupiter count as natural evils. With this in mind, then, natural evils need to be put in the proper context. For this section, I will be primarily focused on the natural evils that are experienced by humans. I will address the evils that are experienced by animals in a later part of this video. With this in mind, it's important to first remember that what was argued for in a previous video about why humans have bodies. I argued that in order for human creatures to learn from their experiences, that they must have an initial range of basic actions. And that initial range of basic actions must extend to a public environment. Likewise, this environment must have predictable laws so that those who participate in the environment are able to have true beliefs about that environment. It would be impossible for creatures to retrain true beliefs if the public environment was constantly changing without being predictable. So such creatures need to stay consistent with their beliefs. This involves there being natural processes by which they can discover that enables them to perform their basic action of control as well as acquire true beliefs about the world. However, as I explained in a previous section of this video, it is also the case that the environment itself is autonomous. But an autonomous creation also predicts a long causal history. And likewise, a long causal history predicts that there are physical processes by which the physical world acts upon. And it just so happens that a lot of the physical processes that the physical world acts upon just so happens to be the same processes that are responsible for the formation of the public environment. In other words, once we realize that theism predicts an autonomous creation, then it also predicts that such a creation would go through a series of long physical processes for billions of years. And those same processes are what's behind the natural evils we see today. This means that whatever natural processes existed before humans were around must still exist in a world with humans. Otherwise, 
humans could not have had true beliefs about the Earth's past history since the processes of nature would have been radically different. With this in mind then, we can deduce that if God creates an autonomous creation, and this creation also goes through cosmic soul building, as we argued for in the previous section, then that would also include that there would be soul building on the natural evils level. So just as humans go through soul building to overcome their evils, so too creation goes through soul building to overcome its evils. Thus, it is expected that on theism, there will be at least some natural evils in the world, as that is a necessary consequence of the way that all of creation is going through soul building. Of course, this alone is not enough to settle natural evils, but it highlights the fact that natural evils would be a consequence of the cosmic soul building of creation itself. Furthermore, the natural evils we see do not have to exist forever, since one day the cosmic soul building will be completed. I will explore this more when I go over the problem of heaven in a future section. But we can see how an autonomous creation lays the groundwork for answering why there is natural evil in the first place. There are some other reasons, however, for why God allows for natural evils. First, God can only allow for soul building if God also creates a world that is itself going through soul building. A world in which natural processes ensure that by our actions we can bring benefits to others, it allows us to grow in virtues such as courage, sympathy, and generosity in response to natural evils. We cannot feel compassion unless there is some type of pain. Now obviously, God does not need to multiply pains in order to multiply compassion, since it is not about the quantity of compassion, but about the quality of compassion. It is good that the range of our compassions will extend far enough to respond to the natural evils in the world. And so, natural evils allow humans to grow in higher level virtues, such as compassion, for others, because compassion would be impossible without pain. Now, if we imagine that all of these suffering caused by natural evils be removed, such as the removal of diseases, the removal of earthquakes, the removal of any other natural entities, then it would have removed our responses to those natural entities, and thus remove our ability to feel compassion from those evils. And so, by God allowing the natural evils of physical pain and other bad things, it allows it to make possible for God to bring about many higher order good states, such as building virtues. I will explore the concept of virtues later in this video. A second reason why God may allow for natural evils is that it allows us to see the effects of our actions. What I mean by this is about our factual knowledge of the effects of our actions. As an example, climate change is caused by humans, and climate change is responsible for a number of natural disasters that we see today. Furthermore, climate change has been linked to new diseases that pop up over time. And so our actions as a species do have an effect on the natural evils that occur. With this in mind, this also forms new moral beliefs about the environment. For example, it would be wrong if we decided to nuke the Amazon rainforest. The rainforest provides a lot of the world's oxygen and sucks CO2 from the atmosphere. However, with the disruption of the rainforest over time, we are slowly losing this valuable resource. If things do not change, then, eventually, the Amazon rainforest will become our foe by releasing more CO2 into the atmosphere. And so, while God might be able to give moderately well-justified knowledge of the effects of our actions without natural processes, he could not allow us to learn what the effects are of our actions without providing natural processes. Natural evil is needed to give us the choice of whether to acquire knowledge of the good and bad effects of our actions, and indeed in order for us to have well-justified knowledge at all. And as we grow older and more mature, we find ourselves with more complicated beliefs about the effects of our actions. And so, God must create creatures which can acquire basic knowledge. If God were to allow me to acquire certain knowledge, such as how to travel to Mars or to kill millions of people, then he must allow me to learn which intermediate states of affairs would lead to those effects. And all knowledge of future events is knowledge of either what natural processes will bring about or what agents will bring about intentionally. We infer future events by either referencing to a predictable natural process, or we know that the nature of an intentional being can bring about any results.
If God is to give humans a range of actions with consequences, he must ensure that human actions have these consequences, either as a result of natural processes or as a result of his intentional action. And if the human agent is to learn about those consequences, then he must learn about them either by discerning the natural processes or by discovering God's intention for the action. And so, with this, in order for God to preserve our serious choice, then God must implant in nature a system of natural causal processes and let us learn what those processes are through their predi predictable patterns. These observations open up a range of possible moral actions that would otherwise not be available. We know that eating certain things causes stomach pain. As we learn about these different natural processes, we can also better predict when they will occur and thus prevent future suffering on our own. This allows us as humans to grow in virtue, as we are able to better predict and stop future natural evils from taking place. And so, if God is to allow us to acquire knowledge by learning from experience, and above all, to allow us to choose whether to acquire knowledge at all, then he needs to provide for natural evils occurring in regular ways as a consequence of natural processes. So in summary, with natural evils, we can deduce natural evils from the fact that theism predicts an autonomous creation and that natural evils allow for soul building and it would not be possible on merely moral evil. And that natural evils also allows us to acquire justified beliefs about a world we live in by having predictable patterns. Of course, there are other versions of the problem of evil that need to be addressed, and so we will continue with moral evil. Now that we have the nature of creation in the background, as well as natural evils, we can understand that humans have themselves developed through these processes. If this is the case, then human nature was itself developed by the random processes of the universe, and it has within it certain characteristics. Now, these characteristics for humans need to be explored in order to understand moral evil. Moral evil cannot be overbrushed as just mere hardships. So viewer description will be advised for this part of the video. The truth of the matter is that our human history is filled with lots of evil, such as genocide, rape, and torture. The Nazis took the Jews and put them in camps to be put to death by poisonous gas. They took children from their mothers and murdered children in front of their parents. They put people in rail cars to not give them food or water for days, and people urinated and defecated on one another. They also performed horrible experiments on young children. The German population at the time knew early on that Hitler wanted to exterminate those who he saw as unequal. And yet, people did nothing when he started rounding up the Jews. In the Soviet Union, there were somewhere between 20 to 26 million people who died from camps. The Soviet Union targeted Ukrainians to starve to death, and they blocked the importation of food to do so. In Japan, there is the example of the rape of Nanking. This is seen by historians as probably one of the few acts of genocide that was worse than what the Nazis did. Chinese men were used for bayonet practice, and decapitation contest. An estimated 20,000 to 80,000 Chinese women were raped. Many soldiers went beyond rape to disavow women, slice off their breasts, and pin them alive to walls. Fathers were forced to rape their daughters, and sons their mothers, as other families members watched. They did things such as live burials, castration, the carving of organs, and the roasting of people alive. There are other examples, such as 1.2 million Armenians being murdered by the Young Turks from 1915 to 1923, 2 million murdered in Cambodia between 1975 and 1978, and 800,000 raped and tortured in Noriaga in 1994. There is also genocide committed against the Native Americans and the enslavement of Africans. And so, I could go on and on about the genocide committed by humans. In every part of the world, in every century, there has been rape, war, and genocide. Furthermore, what makes this worse 
is that the people that committed these genocides were plain old folks in the population. It was ordinary folks who carried out the plans of Hitler and Stalin. And it was ordinary people who let it happen. Almost every genocide researcher has concluded that genocide is what the average person does. Professor and Holocaust survival Frederick Katz sum it up well. Quote, only a tiny portion of the massive killings are attributable to the actions of those people we call criminals or crazy people, or socially alienated people, or even people we would identify as evil people. Rather, they were actually carried out by the plain folk in the population, ordinary people like you and me. Langdon Gutley believed humans were basically good. Until, of course, he was put in an internment camp by the Japanese and he concluded that nothing could be more an error than to think that there is innate moral goodness within humans. As Westerners, we seem to forget that most of our needs are met, and so our primal instincts are not as evident to us. Now of course, some try to argue that there are some people that are good by nature, and that we do not deserve the lives we have. Well, one way to respond to this is by asking if gang members stop at a red light. Well, yes they do. However, they are doing so not because of the law, but rather they do it out of self-interest because they do not want to get hit by incoming traffic. Most people do not rob banks and it is because they don't want to go to jail. Most people choose to not murder since they don't want to go to jail. And much of what motivates our actions is out of self-interest. And so when people do decide to do immoral actions, they do it because they think they are going to get away with it or gain something from it. Even acts of heroism can be motivated by self-interest. And so the hard truth is that no one is innately morally good. If this is the case then, there are no good people for bad things to happen to. And one of the worst lies we can tell ourselves is that we are really innately good and that we do not deserve the world we live in. We like to pretend that we should not face the consequences of our actions. Now, of course, I am not saying that every evil action that happens to a person should be seen as direct punishment, but it is simply to critique the idea that bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people, and this is the case because of the consequences of our actions, both as individuals and as a collective global society. Every person does actions out of self-interest. To put this into numbers, the UN says that it would cost around $45 billion per year until 2030 to end world hunger. Americans alone, however, wasted $116 billion in gambling in 2016. And so, we have everything we need to end things such as world hunger, human trafficking, slavery, etc. Yet, we spend time and money on pointless things. So simply put, moral evil exists because we exist, and we all contribute to this moral evil on a daily basis. Of course, the next question to ask is why did God make us this way? However, as I explored in my previous section of this video, we are given genuine freedom of choice to choose the good or not. Furthermore, given our background regarding the creative order, we were developed through the evolutionary process which gave us the ability to truly be free and not constrained by God directly. We must be able to make free choices without God interfering in the development of creatures. But couldn't God just actively stop moral evil? Couldn't God just stop fire squads or stop the murdering of innocent people or any other moral action? The problem is that this would not be a world in which we can see the consequences of our evil actions. C.S. Lewis says that we can conceive of a world in which God corrected the results of the abuse of free will. So every time that evil action is carried out, something will always be in the way to stop the acting out of the action. However, this would stop humans from being free, and we cannot see the consequences of what evil does to the world. In order to understand why evil must be avoided, we must experience it for ourselves to its fullest extent and allowing humans to live in an evil moral world can be used so that we can learn the full consequences of moral evil. And hopefully, it can be used to grow our characters into better humans.
And so, to summarize moral evil, first is that moral evil exists because of humans, and humans have the free will to choose good or not. And although God could regularly intervene, he doesn't because he wants our species to see the real consequences of our moral evil, which is a life without God's presence and sanctification. The only way to know about such a world is if humans experience a world of evil, since that is what a world without God is like. Of course, this is only about moral evil and not the suffering that humans go through or animal suffering. I will explore that in the next section. Now that we have explored human evil, we need to now expand what I have said thus far into discussing soul building. As I've hinted at throughout this video, a core aspect of my theodicy is soul building. Soul building applies to the cosmos as we've argued, but it also applies to humans and animals. God creates humans and animals to develop into virtuous creatures who are able to follow him freely. This is important to point out, since many arguments from evil assume utilitarian constraints, and so God is required to reduce suffering and increase happiness in every possible instance. Utilitarianism is the idea that the greatest happiness of the greatest number of creatures should be the guiding principle of morality, and so this implies that an action is right if it promotes happiness. Thus, the argument from suffering assumes that God is obligated to reduce suffering as much as possible and promote happiness as much as possible. However, the issue is that if another view of ethics is true, such as deontology and virt or virtue ethics, then God will have different sets of constraints. Deontological theories state that the correct or wrong action should be based on whether that action itself is right or wrong as dictated by certain moral laws. Utilitarianism theories state that the, the correct or wrong action should be based on whether the action itself is promoting the most happiness for the most people. Consequentialism states that the rightness or wrongness of an action depends only on the outcome of the action. So according to some theories, if an action results in the happiness for the majority of people, then it is the right action to do because of its consequences. Virtue ethics, on the other hand, broadly states that one should aim to build a virtuous character and live a flourishing life. This goes beyond merely performing actions due to consequences or moral rules. Performing one's duty or bringing about certain consequences are only aspects and parts of what it means to be a virtuous person. So virtue ethics would argue that deontology and consequentialism are incomplete theories of what morality and ethics actually is about. According to virtue ethics, another important aspect that cannot be ignored is a person's character. Other forms of ethics overlook this or do not place enough emphasis on this aspect. If ethics is simply following rules or applicable moral principles, then a person's morality is independent of their character, emotions, or who they are as a person. But intuitively, someone who does good actions for the wrong reasons is immoral. If a politician passes a law that increases medical care for everyone, one may say that this is a good action. However, if we later find out that the politician gains a large sum of money from doing so, then while the action may be good, the politicians only did it for personal gain, and not because they actually care to give universal health care to all. In other words, one could have a bad moral character while doing good actions. The virtue ethicist, thus, argues that someone with a good moral character would only do be doing the right kind of actions, and so would always apply moral principles in situations and bring about the best outcomes. It is not because of these moral rules or consequences that makes the actions good, but rather they are good because they come from a morally virtuous person. And so, with a theory of virtue ethics, this would preclude a lot of assumptions of the argument from suffering. The argument from suffering assumes that maximizing happiness at all times is the goal of moral rightness, and so maximizing happiness must constrain God's actions. However, I would argue that this doesn't bring about all compossible values. If God is to create a world with the most compossible values, then that would include the values of virtuous creatures. This implies that the goal of God would be to maximize virtues in his creations. 
And so, what moral rightness most likely is, is about promoting virtues, and not merely consequences or moral rules. And so, promoting happiness is subordinate to promoting virtues. Thus, God's primary goal is to promote virtues. This also helps to answer another objection to theism, which is the Goldilocks objection. Basically, if God is going to allow suffering to produce virtues and people, then he has to allow the right amount of suffering. If he allows too much suffering, then he has gone too far and allows suffering where it is not necessary to obtain the greatest virtues. Too little suffering, however, and God will be un unable to attain the highest amount of goodness that would be necessitated by suffering. However, this creates counterintuitive examples. For example, if there was a hundred less Jews killed in the Holocaust, would that result in a worse or better world? If someone lived for ten more seconds to say goodbye to family, would that be better? The answer seems to be no, and furthermore, this also goes against our autonomous creation idea that we argued for previously. It implies that God has to deterministically set everything a certain way, and simply reducing and adding additional instances of suffering would exactly determine what God wanted. However, once again, this assumes a utilitarian idea of goodness and badness, and that God must be obligated to determine the world on this understanding that reduces suffering is what helps achieve God's goals. However, if God's goal is to create free creatures, that choose to become virtuous, then it is probably the case that he doesn't need to create a world with the right amount of suffering. In other words, God could allow one or many of the possible worlds to come about without worrying about whether or not it has the right amount of suffering. Because as long as there is the maximum amount of possible values given an understanding of virtue ethics, then God is not obligated to create a world with the perfect amount of suffering. If God must create the world with the most compossible values, and if the amount of suffering doesn't change this, then God, through his moral goodness, is not required to set up a world with the right amount of suffering. So, there can be a number of possible universes with different ranges of suffering by which God can actualize in order to bring about the values that come through virtuous creatures. Now that we have the soul building in the background, this can help to derive a principle of soul building that can apply to the cosmos. Let's remember that if we live in a conscious universe that goes through soul building, and if God's aim is to maximize virtue building, then God would also need to set up rules and principles by which the world can change through. And as we went over in our section on autonomous creation, we do know that a long causal history to our universe is a consequence of cosmic soul building. And that cosmic soul building requires there be laws by which things can be predictable. Furthermore, when we take into account the other conditions, such as the need for moral knowledge, and that humans and animals need bodies for moral soul building, then a consequence would be that there are law also laws that govern soul building itself. So just as there are certain laws that govern the behaviors and development of the cosmos, so too there are laws that govern the behavior and development of soul building itself. While it may take some time to discover these laws of soul building, one such law can be the Law of Triumph. The Law of Triumph states that if and when a creature encounters suffering, a process can take over where the suffering will have no lasting damage for the creature and be turned entirely into a greater good if that creature so chooses to allow. Basically, the idea is that suffering doesn't need to always happen for a reason, which would contradict autonomous creation. But, if a creature seeks God's possible plan for them, then the Law of Triumph will take over, and this Law of Soul Building will turn all of the experienced instances of suffering into instrumental goods that shape and build each of us into unique virtuous souls with our own unique stories and characteristics. The Law of Triumph guarantees the defeat of all evil and suffering if the creature chooses it, and it allows suffering to itself be a tool for soul building without implying that the suffering was predetermined to occur, as it allows souls to arise through the indeterminate conscious universe in order to develop unique characteristics. So the Law of Triumph is simply a consequence of God creating an autonomous world that can soul build on its own. So it's not an ad hoc addition to theism, but it is a necessary consequence of it. And because of the things we have discussed before about natural evils and human nature, these would simply be consequences of the universe that is soul-building, 
and so evil things will arise naturally and indeterministically. But within this indeterministic world, God uses the law of triumph, so that the suffering that arises from the world can be utilized to aid in the transformation of unique virtuous creatures. Building off from this, we know that bravery as a virtue cannot exist without fear. Compassion cannot come without suffering. Forgiveness cannot come about without someone doing bad actions. And those that overcome suffering become better creatures and build better characteristics that would not be possible without that suffering. Those that try to push the argument from suffering will say that God can create a world with little suffering and virtuous creatures, and so can achieve the base features of virtue. However, a world where free creatures can achieve some of the greatest levels of triumph or the greatest level of defeat over evil will contain some of the most unique and virtuous souls possible. And if the universe is going through the same process, then that would entail that there is instrumental goods that come about by using suffering in order to bring about souls that would have not existed without trials. And this requires a higher range of suffering that is approximately the range that we currently experience. And so, a world with the triumph and defeat of evil is a world with more compossible values than a world without or with less suffering. Now, what about if a person dies from suffering? What if the suffering is so great that a creature was not given enough time to grow in virtue from that process? Well, if God wants to maximize virtuous creatures, then a logical entailment of this is that no creature is left in the dark, and all creatures are given the opportunity for soul building. There cannot be just some arbitrary stopping point for soul building simply because someone dies. There can only be no soul building if a creature chooses it. And so, God must provide an afterlife as a natural consequence of worlds with suffering, so that those who want to continue to grow in virtue can do so. An afterlife is not an auxiliary hypothesis, nor is it being added into the theistic hypothesis. Rather, an afterlife, for generic theism, would be a natural consequence of God wanting to maximize creatures with the most virtues. The goodness of God entails that he would only permit suffering, which is objectively worth it, to any well-functioning rational creature from their perspective. And an afterlife would provide infinite opportunity for the continuation of soul building and the continuation of the defeat of evils. Additionally, if we take into account that the universe is going through soul building, then the final stage of the universe would be when it is in a perfected state and all creatures that have gone through soul building can return to live in a perfect world. So this final state of the world is a consequence of cosmic soul building, and it is not at all an exterior hypothesis. Consider also the fact that God must create the world with the most compossible values. A world in which there is an infinite afterlife, where all creatures can freely soul build and defeat evil, has infinitely more compossible values than a world where creatures go into non-existence when they die. And so, if God must create the world with the most compossible values, and if a world which contains an infinite laugh afterlife for its creatures has an infinite amount of more compossible values than a world with no afterlife, then an atonement of theism is that if God actualizes any possible world, then that world must contain an afterlife. And so, now that we have addressed the argument from suffering, we must now transition into evolutionary evils. Evolutionary evils is perhaps the strongest form of the problem of evil. The argument is that given the billions of years of life on Earth, there has been insurmountable suffering in the very fabric of evolution. The strongest form of this argument is simply that there is an unfair system within the process of evolution which guarantees pain and suffering for an uncountable number of sentient animals. So the entire biological system is evil, and that a good god would never allow for such a system to play out. Well, let's first remember our background information regarding cosmic soul building and natural evils. If the universe is going through soul building, then that would entail that there will be chaos in the initial stages of creation. And if God is to allow for soul building to take place on its own, then there will be evils that play out in the evolutionary stories as a natural consequence of the long causal history to our universe. 
Another problem is that it assumes evolution itself is what causes animal suffering. But this is far from the truth, as evolution doesn't cause suffering itself. Evolution, as understood today, does not entail suffering, since evolution, by itself, is about life evolving. But the exact nature of the world where evolution plays out is not dictated by evolutionary theory. Things such as plate tectonics or any natural disasters are not part of evolution itself. And so there is a key difference between what we have learned about our natural history, which has involved mass extinctions, versus what we understand evolution as a process to be. Our understanding of natural history, such as mass extinctions, is the real core of evolutionary evils. But evolution, in and of itself, doesn't say anything about mass extinctions being integral to the development of organisms. Evolutionary evils are typically referred to as the Darwinian problem, and this problem is a subset of natural evils. And so, the response to this problem is a consequence of my response to the previous problems of evil. We have already responded to the problem of suffering and natural evils in our previous sections, and the moral considerations regarding the idea of soul building that applies to all of creation. But even with these, there is still the question as to why God made evolution happen in the way it did, where the very process itself required the extinction of billions of animal species. So, to begin, if God is to create a world with all compossible values, then that must include what I term aesthetic values. So while there can be moral values that apply to creatures through moral virtues, there may also be aesthetic values that apply as a subset of the total compossible values. Compossible values not just include the moral values or virtues, but they can also include aesthetic virtues. This implies that God is like an artist, and so has different moral constraints than what is traditionally thought. Just as God is committed to maximizing moral virtues, God is also committed to maximizing aesthetic virtues. And so, one of these values or virtues includes God creating the world in and through an indeterministic and chaotic process. I bring this up because there are certain axiological constraints of God's nature that will entail certain consequences. While I don't want to get too much into aesthetic virtues specifically, an important aesthetic value would be the idea of a narrative structure to the world. There is a narrative structure to tragedy and triumph in a meaningful way, where the development of certain creatures allows for the aesthetics of a narrative structure. One such aesthetic value can be a sort of kenotic style of tragedy and triumph. The kenotic style is the idea of the self-emptying of oneself for the goodness of others. Of course, this approach does require a more canonical theism rather than a generic theism, since kenosis is a uniquely Christian idea as it applies to Jesus himself, so one may argue that this lowers the prior probability of theism more generally. But just as we have seen with the afterlife, we are not adding any more content to generic theism, but rather we are seeing its consequences. Just as God creating a world with the most compossible values entails an afterlife, the same entailment goes to the aesthetic values of a narrative structure of triumph and tragedy, as well as kenosis. In the context of evolution, we can refer to this as Darwinian kenosis. Darwinian kenosis is the idea that just like Christ died for our sins, so too there are animals throughout evolutionary history that will die naturally in order for new creatures to emerge after them. As an example, we humans could not exist if the dinosaurs were still around. This implies that there is sort of a cruciform character of animal existence, so that all creatures can participate in a sort of kenotic evolutionary process. Now of course, this does not imply that evolutionary evils are therefore inherently good. That would be like saying that Jesus being crucified on the cross was inherently good. Rather, the important idea is the narrative structure of tragedy and triumph. So taking an approach of combining the aesthetic value of kenosis and the moral values of virtue, building there is the presence of a narrative structure to the world that involves a sort of kenotic style narrative that applies both to the Darwinian history of life on earth as well as the messianic history of redemption. Now we need to ask, is this sort of narrative structure appropriate to an all-loving god? Well, 
as long as God provides an afterlife where there can be more possible values, then it seems this is an action that can bring about the aesthetic values of a narrative structure involving tragedy, triumph, and kenosis. Furthermore, there is also the idea of the defeat condition that God is constrained by in this situation, but I will explore this concept at the end of the video. If we apply this concept, however, to the entire cosmos, then there can be a parallel relationship between the canonical narrative structure of both the Darwinian world emerging and the universe itself going through different stages of its development where stars had to die and be reborn. So both the universe's history and evolutionary history has a loosely teleological tragic narrative that we see in a sort of cosmic kenosis. If this is true, then evolution and canonical theism can have a mutually reinforcing evidential relationship with one another, and thus provide strong evidence for the canonical theism we see in Judaism and Christianity. Building off from this, we can use this same method to respond to inscrutable evils. If we recall, God must create the world with the most compossible values, and if the amount of suffering doesn't change this, then God, through his moral goodness, is not required to set up a world with the right amount of suffering. We can extend this line of reasoning to inscrutable evils, since our grasp on God's general plan is not totally scrutable. God's plan is only partially scrutable to us humans in the context of a narrative structure. And if we apply a cosmic kenosis to evolution, then it is unsurprising that there are inscrutable evils, since there doesn't need to be the perfect amount of suffering in order for God to bring about his cosmic, redemptive, kenotic-style narrative. Now, one may think that this is a skeptical theist move, but it is not, since God doesn't need to make every instance of evil scrutable to us humans, at least not in this lifetime. Now, don't worry, I will say more on inscrutable evils in the last part of this video, but this response so far, I think is important to keep in mind. And so, with the history of the universe and evolutionary evils, these are simply a consequence of the aesthetic values given to us by a cosmic kenosis narrative. This narrative is a consequence of the cosmic soul building ideas we explored pre in the previous sections. And so, evolution, with this history, is very much a prediction of theism. Again, I will explore this concept more in the later parts of this video, but keep this in mind. Divine hiddenness is an objection to theism that is separate from the problem of evil. The core of the problem is about why there is unbelief, and why God can't make his existence known to all creatures. Some consider the problem of divine hiddenness to be equal or even sometimes a stronger argument than the problem of evil. However, I disagree, as the problem of divine hiddenness only seems to affect a relatively small portion of the population, at least among those who profess to be unbelievers. The problem of evil not only affects everybody, but it comes in various different forms. Throughout this video, I have responded to each of these different forms of the problem of evil. In this section, I will be using the background theodicy that I developed in order to extend it into answering divine hiddenness. With that in mind, let's first begin with J. L. Skullenberg's argument. Premise 1. If there is a god, he is perfectly loving. Premise 2. If a perfectly loving God exists, reasonable non-belief does not occur. Premise 3. Reasonable non-belief occurs. Conclusion. Thus, no perfectly loving God exists. Thus, there is no God. The crucial premise in this argument seems to be premise 2. The support for 2 depends upon the nature of a loving God, as well as if a loving God would provide sufficient evidence for belief in his, in his existence to those who are willing to be in a relationship with him. The core issue is whether it is moral for God to keep his existence in the dark for those who truly seek him. Thus, the problem of divine hiddenness can be broken into two distinct problems. There is the moral problem, which is about whether it is morally permissible for God to not make his existence obvious to those who seek him, and then there is the epistemic problem, which is about the epistemic demands that people have in order to believe God exists. I will begin with the moral problem first because that is the more important aspect of the argument. We need to assume that the argument is talking strictly about those who seek God, and yet are not convinced that God exists. My response to this would be that all creatures already have a basic sense of God, 
Now, I know that a lot of viewers would be skeptical, so I will explain what I mean. First, is that the hiddenness argument relies on the assumption that God is a perfectly loving being. And of course, this definition matches with my definition of God as absolute perfection, as explained in a previous video. So then, God's goodness can extend to those who actively seek the good. What I'm saying is that everyone actively seeks the good in their lives even if they don't realize that it is God who they are seeking. For example, whenever we seek a sense of happiness, we can feel the positive aspect of happiness, and we can feel that it is positively good. And if under theism, goodness is identical to God, then in some sense we are experiencing God, even if we don't understand God's full presence in our lives. The very fact that we can sense goodness in our lives means that we can already believe that there is goodness in the world. It's just that we may not have an understanding about the true nature of goodness. However, under theism, the true nature of goodness is God, who himself is the good. So then, everyone, by experiencing the good in their lives, already has a basic belief in goodness. So logically speaking, everyone already experiences God in their lives, even if they don't realize it's God's true nature that they are experiencing. And so with this in mind, we can see that this is very problematic for the moral problem of divine hiddenness. The moral problem of divine hiddenness is the objection that it is not morally permissible for God to not make his existence obvious to those who seek him. Well, if God is goodness itself, then he has already made his existence known to all creatures by them experiencing some aspect of goodness in their lives. If creatures seek God, then they are ultimately seeking goodness and vice versa. And creatures who seek the good receive the good, and thus receive God's goodness who is the good. So whoever seeks goodness seeks God, and God's goodness is present in their lives by a good state of affairs. Experiencing God's goodness does not require one to have an explicit dogmatic belief about the nature of goodness. And so it logically follows that everyone who seeks the good will experience the good, and thus the moral problem of divine hiddenness is undercut. Now, perhaps the objection can be modified to where it is not morally permissible to keep for God to keep his entire nature hidden from us. And so, even if God is, does reveal a part of his good nature to us by allowing us to experience the goodness in our lives, he is not morally obligated to keep his entire nature hidden from us especially those who actively seek to experience the full nature of God himself. In response, we should keep in mind the theodicy we are working with. Soul building is very much a part of God slowly revealing himself to us. I agree that God must reveal his goodness to us by allowing us to experience the goodness in our lives. In fact, God's goodness links to a good state of affairs, and that serves as positive evidence for theism. But there is nothing that requires God to fully reveal himself at this moment in our development. As we've explained throughout this video, a big part of our development for virtue is living in the right type of environment. Furthermore, if God is the good, then what makes us really be ready to be in his full presence? As we explained in our section on the moral problem of evil, we humans have a nature that is inherently selfish and causes bad things to occur in the world. If God wants us to see the full consequences of our sins, then he must stay hidden for a temporary moment in time in order for us to see the damage that human evil causes in such a short time span. Once we realize the moral evil that is part of humanity, we can be motivated to change by building virtues so that we can experience the full presence of God when our characters are fully ready. The bottom line is that God has already allowed us to experience a part of him because each one of us experiences goodness in our lives. This even applies to what is termed non-resistant, non-assumption, non-believer. This type of believer would be an isolated non-theist, who is not even able to suspect that there is a God who they might relate to. And so even in this situation, there is a presence of God in our life through them experiencing good states of affairs. Their relationship with God is in relation to their good states of affairs. Now, of course, what about those who experience no good state of affairs? Well, first, it is hard to find any actual examples where this generally takes place for a creature. 
everyone experiences some goodness in their lives. And secondly, the moral problem of divine hiddenness just boils down to some version of the problem of evil, which we have addressed in previous section, if we are to use this objection. Now, what about the propositional knowledge about God's full nature? Can't, do can't God just make his full presence known to all while they are growing in virtue? After all, there are many religious people who have propositional knowledge in God's full nature. Well, this is not a good assumption to make about the nature of belief. And so there could be two types of belief. The first type of belief is propositional, which I will term basic theism. And the second type of belief is robust theism or fecal knowledge. God desires that we have fieli knowledge, which is where God is the foundation of our lives. This begins by us learning what a world without his presence is like by understanding our selfish natures. Since the very logic of soul building requires that we all start off as creatures that need to improve, then the beginning of God revealing himself is the realization that we are unworthy to see God's full nature. We should remember that discovering God's true presence is not like meeting a new friend. Finding out there is a perfect being which could destroy all of existence would bring negative emotions to people. They would either use God for their own self-interest by seeking rewards or by fear of punishment. This is a consequence for those who have not fully developed into the creatures that God desires they be. The fundamental problem is that human humanity already has the wrong desires, and humans being forced to accept the propositional knowledge of God's full nature and not merely the goodness of their lives would not really change anything. Another problem with the divine hiddenness argument is that if my theodicies on the problem of evil are applied in this situation, then God would not be required to provide the perfect amount of revelation to his creatures. If we recall, God must create the world with the most compossible values. And if the amount of suffering doesn't change this, then God through his moral goodness is also not required to set up a world with the right amount of immediate revelation. If God is to maximize virtue, then there doesn't need to be a right amount of revelation. God could provide immediate and full revelation of his existence to some, but it doesn't mean that it needs to apply to all. While we are currently spiritually immature, God stays physically hidden so that we can grow in love and humility. We all still do experience the presence of God through the good states of affairs in our lives. But the full nature of God is not revealed to us until we are ready. God knows the best way to reveal his true nature to every member of the human race. Now of course, some would argue that this is unfair since some receive more of a revelation of God than others. But this assumes everyone is the same and will respond to God in a loving way. God, being omniscient, knows who he needs who needs more information to change and who needs more time to change, as well as these who needs less information and less time to change. You cannot assume that everyone should receive the full knowledge of, of God's nature at an immediate instance. And so, the moral problem of divine hiddenness doesn't seem to have any sort of weight on the existence of God. Now, what about the epistemic problem? The epistemic problem is about the epistemic demands that people have in order to believe God exists. Some people demand more evidence or have a higher standard than others, but yet God, God doesn't give it to them. Well, the first problem with this version of divine hiddenness is that it assumes too much about the reasonableness of humanity. It assumes that humans are so reasonable that if they are given the proper objective evidence, and if God were to give them objective epistemic justification for his existence, then they would believe. However, this seems to go against studies in psychology, which do indicate that we often dismiss the evidence to hold onto what we desire to be true. What we want to believe, often, is what we make our reality to be, despite the evidence. This is backed up by a wealth of data in the field of psychology. So even if God gave everybody enough evidence to believe, that doesn't say anything about whether they would believe he exists, and it doesn't say anything about the epistemic justification of belief in God. As we went over in a previous video, there is evidence for God as more likely on theism than naturalism. And in my next video, there will be more considerations regarding the epistemic status of theism. So the epistemic status of belief in God cannot and should not be decided by the subjective opinions of certain groups.
the epistemic problem of divine hiddenness assumes a subjective epistemic conservatism principle, which goes in conflict with a more objective conception of evidence. If an atheist insists that God is too hidden, and therefore likely does not exist, then we need to know why, beyond their subjectivity, on what constitutes as enough evidence. Why should we think that there is not enough evidence for God given the amount of evidence? If people will desire to believe in what they want to be true anyways, then it doesn't really matter. So the argument against a cumulative case for God needs to be made beyond the mere subjective opinion of, I don't think there is enough evidence, therefore it is not enough to make me believe. Of course, while there are atheist responses to the cumulative case for God, I will not be addressing those until the next video. My point is only that the mere subjective proposition that an atheist doesn't think there is enough evidence for God does not at all show that the cumulative case for God is inherently flawed in an objective sense. An atheist needs to provide a better theory that can account for the data in a more plausible way than theism. Not merely just say that there is not enough evidence for theism to think that the divine hiddenness goes through. And so, the fundamental problem with the epistemic divine hiddenness argument is that there is too much subjectivity involved in regards to an actual probability regarding if divine hiddenness serves as actual evidence against theism. Now, because of these concerns, my own view is that divine hiddenness is evidence against theism. However, it is merely epiphenomenal. For example, I can provide testimonial evidence that you exist. What I say is evidence that you exist. However, this evidence can't do any epistemic work for whatever the epistemic status of your existence is by yourself won't be changed by, the, by my testimony. Another example is our awareness of the lack of complete reliability of our sources of information. Our awareness that we lack complete reliability of our sense data and lack reliability in our cognitive abilities, as well as the evidence that we tend to believe in things that we want despite the evidence, is awareness of evidence against almost everything we believe. The point is that we are not perfectly rational creatures, and our awareness of this and the fact that we can make mistakes in our epistemic judgment is itself evidence that all of our current beliefs are probably false. However, this evidence is merely epiphenomenal evidence, for it doesn't alter the epistemic status of our beliefs. Factoring in the evidence that we are not infallible does not make any, our, any of our beliefs any less rational than what they would have been if we didn't have such evidence. And so it is my view that the argument from divine hiddenness works in the exact same way. So I grant that hiddenness is evidence against theism, but this evidence is merely epiphenomenal. It does not work regarding the overall epistemic status of belief in God. My conclusion on this logically follows from the premises of our key epistemic notions that are to be understood objectively and should not invoke any subjective preferences. There is simply too much subjectivity involved in regards to an actual probability regarding divine hiddenness, and because it is subjectivity, it makes divine hiddenness be epiphenomenal evidence against theism, since it has no bearing on the objective epistemic status of theism. So in summary, there is the moral problem, which is about whether it is morally permissible for God to not make his existence obvious to those who seek him, and then the epistemic problem, which is about the epistemic demands that people have in order to believe God exists. For the moral problem, my first response is that God being goodness implies that God is always present and not hidden from those who experience good states of affairs. So whoever seeks goodness seeks God, and God's goodness is present in their lives by a good state of affairs. Experiencing God's goodness does not require one have an explicit dogmatic belief about the nature of goodness. And so it logically follows that everyone who seeks the good will experience the good, and thus the moral problem of divine hiddenness is undercut. Secondly, since by the very logic of soul building requires that we all start off as creatures that need to improve, then the beginning of God revealing himself is the realization that we are unworthy to see God's full nature. Seeing God's full nature, while in an immature state, would ultimately backfire where we seek God for rewards, where they would either seek God for their own self-interest, by seeking rewards, or by fear of punishment. Third, is that given humanity is not fully developed, that we already have the wrong desires, 
and humans being forced to accept the propositional knowledge of God's full nature and not merely the goodness of their lives would not really change anything. If God is to maximize virtue in building characters, then there doesn't need to be a right amount of revelation. But rather, God can reveal himself at the right time and place for each person's unique development. And so, God knows the best way to reveal his true nature to every member of the human race, and we shouldn't assume everyone in this is the same and would respond to God in a loving way. For the epistemic problem, this boils down to the subjective nature of belief. First, this version of the divine hiddenness argument assumes that all humans would believe in God if given the right amount of evidence. But this seems to go against studies in psychologies, which do indicate that we often dismiss the evidence to hold on to what we desire to be true. The mere subjective proposition that an atheist doesn't think there is enough evidence does not at all show that the cumulative case for God is inherently flawed in an objective sense. Secondly, is that there is simply too much subjectivity involved in regards to an actual probability regarding if divine hiddenness serves as actual evidence against theism. So epistemically speaking, divine hiddenness is evidence against the existence of God, but this evidence is merely epiphenomenal. It does not work regarding the overall objective status of belief in God. With these considerations, it is now time to go on to the final version of the problem of evil, which is called the problem of heaven. Now we get into the final version of the problem of evil, which is termed the problem of heaven. This problem is an attempt to undermine soul-building theodicies and free will theodicies. The basic idea is that if it is impossible for agents to make free choices in a universe whose every contingent detail is chosen by a perfect being, then it follows that agents have free choice in heaven only if it is not the case that the choices of a perfect being determine the nature of heaven. However, heaven is supposed to be a place where there is more, no moral or natural evil. Another way to put it is that if a perfect being is unable to choose to make a universe in which everyone always freely chooses the good, then how is it that a perfect being is able to choose to make a heaven in which everyone always freely chooses the good? The problem of heaven is similar to the original problem we discussed in this video, which was Mackey's Dilemma. We addressed this in detail already, but the framework in responding to it will be expended upon here. However, in order to address the problem of heaven, we must first lay out the argument. Premise 1. Necessarily, there is no evil in heaven. Premise 2. If there is morally significant freedom in heaven, then it is not the case that necessarily there is no evil in heaven. Premise 3. Therefore, there is no morally significant freedom in heaven. Number 4. Heaven is a domain in which the greatest goods are realized. 5. Therefore, the greatest goods can be realized in a domain in which there is no morally significant freedom. 6. A perfect being can just choose to make a domain that contains the greatest goods and no evil. 7. A world that contains the greatest goods and no evil is non-arbitrarily better than any world that contains the greatest goods and comparatively lesser goods and the amounts of kinds of evils that are found in our universe. 8. If a perfect being chooses among options, and one option is non-arbitrarily better than the other option, then the perfect being chooses that option. Conclusion: Therefore, it is not the case that a perfect being made our universe. Now, the argument is largely valid, but there are several issues that need to be addressed. First, let's recall what we went over in the beginning of the video. My conclusion on responding to Mackey's dilemma was that if there are worlds that have the maximum range of good and evil, and if those worlds contain more compossible values than a world without that range, then it follows by reason that God would not create a world in which everyone just happens to choose a good, but God would create a world which has actual evil that saints must overcome and defeat. So a world in which evil exists, or evil must be defeated, is a better world than a world in which evil never exists. This conclusion was drawn given a certain understanding of genuine freedom. The, d the three conditions of genuine freedom are theistic determination, self-determination, and flourishing. Theistic determination is that all of creation itself is free and autonomous. I explored reasons for this in my section on autonomous creation, where creation would go through a sort of cosmic soul building that generates its values and respond to its own pressures. The endgame for creation would then be an eternal paradise that is similar to the traditional vision of heaven. 
Self-determination is a consequence of this, which is where creatures evolved through the creative process on their own. Since God does not directly determine everything, then agents with free will emerge and then act out on their own. It allows creatures to come about who do not have identities or natures determined by God, and so they're not forced to act in a certain way, and instead, the environments and genetics of each creature shape us in unique ways to give us genuine freedom. With this freedom, given from our environment, the agent is the one who directs or is the sufficient cause of any action they commit. There are no influences beyond the person, and the person is the ultimate decider in the actions of what they choose. Finally, there is flourishing, which is the idea of soul building and moral development throughout time. It allows growth for the individual to develop so that they are not forced to act in a certain way. With this understanding of the nature of freedom then, we can also use it to respond to the problem of heaven. My response would be in questioning premise 6 and premise 7. First is the obvious problem of cosmic soul building. Cosmic soul building is not possible under a view of heaven in which heaven is created instantly without any prior development. The mental capacity of the universe could not mediate between value facts and cosmological facts freely on its own, but rather it is completely determined by God. This would not be a creation that contains all possible values. The value of a self-actualizing conscious universe, via a rene processes, is the same value that humans are endowed with when they have the ability to form their own moral characters through the history of free choices, without being determined by God. But the view of heaven that proponents of the problem of heaven propose doesn't seem to have this sort of value. Secondly, this would imply determinism, where God instantly created a perfect world without any evolutionary history, and then created us with moral characters so that we would inevitably always choose to be good, since there can be no evil bad actions in heaven. But this would violate our conception of genuine freedom, where there cannot be any influences from God that determine someone's nature. Third, this would make the aesthetic values of a narrative structure of triumph and tragedy as well as kenosis impossible. A narrative structure where heaven is created instantly with no prior development of triumph and tragedy is something which completely lacks narration in the first place. The values of a narrative structure cannot exist in a specially created heaven. However, there are many other issues with the problem of heaven. The fourth problem is about the freedom that actually matters. This has to do with the conception of morally significant freedom. Morally significant freedom is defined as a person that is free with respect to an action that is morally significant for them. And an action that is morally significant, it would be wrong for them to perform the action, but it would right to reframe or vice versa. And so, morally significant freedom can only exist if there is a difference in the moral outcome of what one is doing. So one moral option is good and the other option is bad. Now for God, it is the case that God cannot have this type of freedom since God could never have the option to choose a bad action. But as we explained in, a, in the previous or in the beginning part of this video, God having maximal value doesn't imply God has all values. And there is a difference between max, a maximally being and the best kind of world. And so, morally significant freedom is a value that humans have. Now, with that in mind, let's return to morally significant freedom. Given our background on soul building, it would be the case that the value in morally significant freedom is not valuable in and of itself, but rather, morally significant freedom helps to build unique persons. God in this life gives us morally significant freedom so that we can learn to cooperate with goodness and do good actions, rather than be determined to do so. By the time someone gets to heaven, their character will be so similar to God that they no longer have the will to do evil actions. That good character could not be formed freely unless they first had morally significant freedom. And so the value of morally significant freedom is that it allows us to build our characters freely without being forced to do so. And so morally significant freedom is valuable as to allow creatures to build their own characters. But once they have a character, that is in line with goodness, then morally significant freedom is no longer valuable. With this in mind, this brings us to the final problem, which is about ultimate responsibility. We can say that it is intrinsically valuable that God creates agents who have ultimate responsibility when it comes to morally significant actions, and that this ultimate responsibility is what allows us to freely build our characters.
To be ultimately responsible for an action, an agent needs to be the ultimate causal source of the action or the outcome. It seems that a world in which God creates agents who have ultimate responsibility with respect to moral action is better than a world in which God creates agents who never have such responsibility. If God decided to create agents to initially have a perfect moral character, then these agents would not have ultimate responsibility with respect to their morally significant actions because they could not freely form their characters at all. Instead, it is God who would be ultimately responsible over the created agent's morally significant actions. Of course, an objection to this is that if creatures have ultimate responsibility because they freely choose to build their characters, then what about God? Wouldn't God lack ultimate responsibility? Well, it is only necessary that created beings have significant freedom in order to have ultimate responsibility. If God creates an agent with a perfect moral character, then something external and prior determines the created agent's perfect moral character, and so it does determine how the created agent would act with respect to morally significant actions. However, the created agent would not be ultimately responsible with respect to morally significant actions. God, however, is an uncreated and necessary being. God cannot choose wrong actions because God has a perfect moral character, essentially, as nothing external or prior to him determines that he has a perfect moral character. And so in the case of God, the reason why God cannot do any wrong actions is based on God himself. And so God has ultimate responsibility with respect to morally significant actions. Nothing outside or prior to God causally determines God's nature. And so this allows God's own moral character to, to be the source of his own action, given that his action is the result of his essential nature. Of course, there are, there are deeper objections to this idea. As Morrison writes, quote, If I simply chance to exist, and if my nature determined me to always choose to do the good, then I would be no more responsible for my good behavior than I would be if someone had made me with that same nature. In either case, I would be doing only what my nature determined me to do, something other than myself, this, my nature, would be determined me to choose the good. But Frederick and Easter respond to this objection by pointing out the relationship between God's moral character and him being unable to do wrong actions. One can simply deny that God's perfect moral character causes him to be unable to do bad actions. And instead, the relationship between God's perfect moral character and God being unable to do bad actions is a non-causal relationship. And so, God's perfect moral character entails that he is unable to do wrong actions, and that God is unable to do wrong actions because he has a perfect moral character. But the perfect moral character is not causing God to do no bad actions. We need to remember that nothing can causally affect God. And so God's perfect moral character simply entails no bad actions, but that doesn't mean that it causes him to do more bad actions. To see what I mean, let's propose these two ideas. 1. If nothing causes Y, and Y entails Z, then Z is not causally determined by anything. 2. If X causally determines Y, and Y entails Z, then Z is causally determined by X. Given one, nothing can causally determine that God has a perfect moral character. And if having that character entails that God can't do wrong actions, then nothing causally determines that God cannot do wrong actions. And so God would still be ultimately responsible with respect to morally significant actions. Given two, however, if God causally determines that a created agent has a perfect moral character, and if having a perfect moral character entails that the agent cannot do wrong actions, then God causally determines that the agent cannot do wrong actions. Therefore, the agent would not be ultimately responsible if God gave them a perfect moral character. And so giving agents significant freedom over the span of their lifetime helps to develop the moral characters and allows them to have ultimate responsibility in their characters and their actions. And given our previous replies in regards to the nature of cosmic soul building and morally significant freedom, this gives us good reason to deny pre premise 6 and premise 7 of the argument. This is simply an extension of my response to Mackey's dilemma. If God must create a world with maximum genuineness, then it follows that God must create a world with maximum ultimate responsibility, and that such a world must have and contain all possible values. These values include things such as virtuous soul-building and having the ultimate freedom in choosing to love God or not.
there must be genuine freedom of choice to accept or reject God. And doing this requires that we each build our own unique characters, as well as creation itself is not determined by God to act in a certain way. And so it follows by reason that God would not create us in heaven, as heaven itself is something that develops over time freely without being constrained. And so our theodicy is now complete, and it is now time to put it all together. Now it is finally time to summarize the main points and connect the dots together. Let's first remember the nature of ideal explanatory flexibility. A model of the world that has ideal explanatory flexibility is a model that meets the demand for it to be responsive to evidence. And in the case of theism, we can see how theism has the resources to respond to the evidence from evil and divine hiddenness. If we recall in a previous video, we recall that the nature of God is goodness. And since God is goodness, then God would only create the best kinds of worlds. And so it follows that God, given his nature, would create a world which has value, and hence there is a certain limit to the types of worlds that God creates. But in our general considerations, especially when it comes to explanatory flexibility, there is the consideration of the best kind of world containing the most possible values. This narrows down the range of worlds that God is most likely to create. Since if there are worlds that have the maximum range of good and evil, and if those worlds contain more values than a world without that range, then it follows by reason that God would create worlds with the most possible values. The real question then comes down to what are the values that we should select for? Well, in this video, I have relied heavily upon virtue ethics in order to argue for soul building. I also relied heavily on the idea that God is more analogous to an artist when it comes to creation, and so this will restrict God to narrative genres in creating worlds, and one of these genres is kenosis. So evolutionary evils are simply a consequence of the aesthetic values given to us by a cosmic kenosis narrative. And the entire universe soul builds using this narrative. Finally, there is the idea of an afterlife, which allows all creatures to continue to soul build, and that heaven is simply a consequence of a perfect universe that has completed its soul building. Of course, the fundamental objection to all of this is that I am simply building all of these things into the hypothesis of theism. And so, I am therefore lowering the prior probability of theism by adding the fact that God is only interested in maximizing virtue, that God is an artist who works through cosmic kenosis, and that God would create an afterlife. My response to this objection is that we are not adding to the content of theism, but simply pointing out its consequences in light of these value constraints. We need to remember that the pattern of the distribution of good and evil in the world is the data that we are trying to explain. In other words, the axiological compossible values are not being built into theism, since the axiological compossible values simply is the data itself. Whatever the compossible values are must be already assumed in order for the problem of evil to get off the ground. So both sides must assume a value theory, because the value theory is what determines the total set of distribution of good and evil states. So theism is not building in a particular value theory, since the value theory is what determines what will be the data of good and evil itself. The axiology of compossible values is the data, and theism simply predicts that there are certain sets of compossible values that God is constrained by, mainly that God on the moral values is to maximize virtue, and that God on the aesthetic values is to be an artist that creates a world through cosmic hypnosis. These are not built into theism, but rather they are a logical consequence of theism given the value theory. If the value theory is part of the background, then God would respond to that value theory, as God is to maximize the values that the value theory says is the case. If the value theory is that virtue is the highest good, then God would maximize virtues. If the value theory says that aesthetic values, such as cosmic kenosis, are good, then God would allow the whole universe to soul-build through that process. To see what I mean, let's think about the following examples. 
Suppose that it is quite possible that the evidence for common descent of humans and chimps are that they share a common ancestor is consistent with both Darwinian gradualism and punctuism. Now suppose biologists discovered that it was simply impossible for the mutations postulated by punctuationism to occur, so punctuationism was effectively ruled out. This should not decrease our confidence in common descent, because common descent is a general hypothesis, and not specific like these examples. Another example is let's suppose that someone named Lives becomes convinced from historical studies that Christianity is true. Suppose further that there are only three ways to be Christian, which are to be Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, or Protestant. And in the course of investigating each of these species of Christianity, she learns about the problems of Protestantism and so effectively eliminates Protestantism from her options. However, Lee's credence in Christianity in no way goes down because of this. And so, in both these cases, it suggests that one's support for a theory pertains directly to its general features. And so eliminating a species of a theory does not decrease the probability of the main theory. A final example is to consider different theories within the philosophy of mind. Let's say that someone named Dorothy thinks that the interaction problem refused dualism and so thinks that materialism is true. She then reflects on the fact that there are reductive and non-reductive physicalists, and she initially assigns an equal probability to these two theories. She then comes to learn that non-reductive physicalism is incoherent and so metaphysically impossible. However, should Dorothy therefore reduce her credence in physicalism as a whole? It seems that she should not do so. And so it seems to me that in these cases, that not only do the previous considerations apply, but because the hypothesis has been discovered to have been impossible all along, then what is happening is essentially our repartitioning of the outcome space. You are going to get back to the beginning and taken out one of the possible outcomes in the list, because as you know, it should have never been part of the probabilities in the first place. And so, with the data of evil, one can argue that it rules out various species of theism, but not the general theory of theism. If God is constrained by, for example, by utilitarianism, where God must always maximize happiness and decrease suffering, then I would say that the problem of evil rules out theism. However, notice that this argument relies on a utilitarian value theory. If one rejects utilitarianism and holds rather to a virtue ethics theory, where God must always maximize virtues and not necessarily decrease suffering, then God would do so. Again, the value theory is what determines the total range regarding evil. And if the problem of evil is to be used against theism, then the problem of evil will rely on the data of evil. And likewise, that data of evil itself depends on a particular value theory. And so, we can preserve the probability of the general hypothesis of theism even when there are specific types of theisms that can be eliminated. We must remember that to judge the value of a world, we must make assumptions about what values are in the first place. We must be able to make judgments about which kinds of states of affairs are better than others, and that always requires certain value theories that will, that will determine what is good and bad. With this in mind, one can think of the problem of evil as analogous to the problem of consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness is how first-person mental experiences come about from purely third-person properties. Within the literature and the philosophy of mind, the hard problem of consciousness is considered as a fatal objection to reductive physicalism. But the hard problem of consciousness goes away when we change our assumptions about consciousness itself. Instead of thinking of consciousness as being reducible to matter, if one simply changes the assumption that consciousness is irreducible, then the hard problem goes away. It's not that we are necessarily solving the hard problem of consciousness, but rather we are dissolving the problem by changing certain fundamental assumptions. My view is that this si same line of reasoning applies to the problem of evil. When we have a certain value theory, such as virtue ethics and cosmic kenosis, then there can be a sort of paradigm shifting about our fundamental assumptions about value, and so the problem of evil gets dissolved. My theodicy begins with a virtue-value-driven approach by which certain virtues are the highest goods. Virtues such as courage, compassion, kindness, generosity, benevolence, mercy, magnanimity, tolerance, honor, truthfulness, trustworthiness, 
ultimate responsibility, friendship, cooperation, diligence, discipline, helpfulness, gratitude, empathy, forgiveness are all good things, and the apex of love, or the apex of value, would be sacrificial love, which is kenosis. And so going off this value theory and these values assumptions, then the assumption is how one responds in life is more important than what happens to someone in life. The best kind of life is not someone living in only happiness and no suffering, but rather the one exemplifying the highest virtues and the greatest of these virtues of love. Of course, one may reject this value theory and one may see my theodicy as unsuccessful. But then, that is a dispute in axiology, and not the problem of evil. The problem of evil is meant to be an internal critique of theism given a certain value theory. But if the axiological assumptions, the value theory, and the problem of evil are false, then the problem of evil does not get off the ground. The axiology of theism and the problem of evil must be common ground in order for the problem of evil to be an internal critique. Otherwise, it is just the problem of things one doesn't like. And so, what can be expected from this is that with the value constraints in place, then a logically necessary condition for the display of the highest virtues entails that there will be evils and sufferings of a certain intensity, insofar as they must generate the highest virtues. And so the right way to judge the moral value of the world is how it exemplifies the highest virtues, and not by how much suffering exists. With this in mind, then given the value theory, then God would create a world with these virtues can grow. And so God must create a world by which there is a high probability that the maximum number of people will achieve and display virtues. If this is true, however, then there would be a narrow range by which the highest virtues could be properly exemplified, achieved, and displayed. This happens both at the human and, and animal level, as well as the cosmos as a whole through the self-sacrificing love of cosmic kenosis. I am calling my systematic theodicy the evolving world theodicy, since the greatest virtues are only possible when the world slowly evolves for billions of years through a system of cosmic kenosis, and through this system, every creature can build their identity and have their ultimate responsibility for the development of their characters. The evolving world theodicy is the set of the best kinds of worlds that God can create, given the value theory that we are operating on. If God must create the best kinds of worlds, then he creates the best kinds of worlds which have the most compossible values, and if those values includes virtues and kenosis. Through virtues and kenosis, everyone is ultimately responsible for choosing to build their own moral characters by their free will, and the cosmos as a whole is evolving in a, into a perfected state which we traditionally called heaven. Thus, the world evolves into heaven. We can put a certain probability of how likely it is that God would create such a world. Let T be bare theism. Let K be the class of the best possible worlds. Every world, K in K, is a world with a significant number of opportunities for soul building and the maximum number of saints. All saints display some of the highest virtues, and all of those virtues require very significant trials. And thus, every world K in K is a world in which there are significant trials. Let K be the proposition that the actual world is a member of the K, and let EW be the evolving world's theodicy. That entails what I have said in this video. Now, of course, some would object that adding the evolving world's theodicy is an auxiliary hypothesis to bare theism and lowers its prior probability so low that it ends up favoring naturalism. However, once again notice that we are operating under a value theory. The value theory is the data, and is not something being added onto. Theism responds to whatever value theory is the case, and so isn't adding any more content. Furthermore, the evolving world's theodicy entails an afterlife, as, as shown through cosmic kenosis, and that God must maximize the achievement of virtues. This in turn entails that T, T equals W, which by simple theorem entails that theism entails the evolving world's theodicy. In other words, given the value theory and that God must create the best kinds of worlds, then if according to the value theory, also known as the data, entails that the best kind of worlds are evolving worlds, then God would create the evolving worlds.
With this in mind, we can see how it is very likely that God would create an evolving world that could be a certain virtue building rage for both the cosmos and its creatures. Now of course, one final objection to this is that there is simply too much suffering in the world. However, it is hard to argue that there is too much suffering given our understanding that God desires a world with many opportunities for heroic virtues. If we mean too much as to say, as in that it could never be defeated, then it doesn't seem like we have any evidence at all that any creature has gone through suffering in which it is undefeatable. Even for those who die before they are able to grow virtues, that tells us very little about their eventual state of mind with respect to their total existence. There may exist traumas from which no finite mind could recover, but there is no evidence that this type of evil has ever fallen on any creature. And so, this brings us to the last argument from evil. But instead of it being an argument against theism, it is an argument for theism. Premise 1. God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good. Premise 2. If God is all-good, then he will only create the best kinds of worlds. Premise 3. If God is all-powerful, nothing could prevent God from acting on his goodness to bring about the best goods. Conclusion. Therefore, nothing could prevent God from creating the worlds with the best kinds of goods. 5. The best kinds of goods are the authentic display of Apex and Kenosis love manifesting virtues. 6. Therefore, God will bring about a world fostering the authentic display of Apex and Kenosis love manifesting virtues. 7. The authentic display of Apex and Kenosis love manifesting virtues, or creation and creation having ultimate responsibility for growing virtues, logically entails the occurrence of very significant bad states of affairs, or the evolving world's theodicy. Therefore, God will bring about a world described in the evolving world's theodicy. If 8, then theism strongly predicts evolving worlds. 10, therefore, theism strongly predicts evolving worlds. Naturalism does not predict evolving worlds. Therefore, evolving worlds favors theism against naturalism. Now, of course, the biggest objections to this argument would be rejecting premise 5 and premise 11. First, to deny premise 5 is to reject the value theory that we are operating on. But if one does this, then they cannot raise the problem of evil using the value theory. If God creates at all, and if there is a great value in virtues such as apex love and soul building, then given the goodness of God, this would be the only kind of world he could create. Secondly, to deny premise 11, one would at best need to say that naturalism is only compatible with evolutionary creation, while on theism you can have evolutionary creation and special creation. And since on evolutionary creation is the only option for naturalism, then there could be no special creation on naturalism, Then, but that there can't be special creation on theism, then we can say that special creation is at least some evidence in favor of naturalism. And since we do see that the only option available to naturalism, in, the case, in this case evolutionary creation, is actually the case, then evolutionary creation or the type of world that we live in would be evidence for naturalism. The problem, however, is that it is equally true that theism is only compatible with the best kinds of worlds. So on theism, there can be no worst kinds of worlds. However, for naturalism, there can be worse worlds on evolution in the sense that the total existence of certain creatures was horrible. And so it is not a logical contradiction for there to exist a worse world on naturalism. But there would be a logical contradiction for there to exist a special creation on naturalism. And so this means that there is a sort of symmetry between theism not allowing for worse worlds and naturalism not allowing for special creation. But the fundamental difference in this is that if theism makes positive predictions about evolutionary creation given the value constraints of things such as cosmic kenosis, then those worlds do serve as positive efforts for theism. Theism requires that there is a sufficient intensity to develop the highest virtues, and that there is sufficient frequency to provide multiple opportunities to form virtuous creatures. And so, within the evolutionary worlds for theism, none of those worlds can be non-best kind of world. But there can only be best kinds of worlds within evolutionary worlds, and thus, there must be a certain fine-tuning to the frequency and intensity of the distribution of evil. But for naturalism, this is not the case, as naturalism has no constraints on the intensity and frequency of the distribution of evils. The farthest that naturalism can go, in terms of prediction, is that there is evolutionary creation, 
but that says nothing about the distribution of good and evil within evolutionary creation. And if it turns out that there are great values in evolutionary creation that are not possible in special creation, and those values are more likely on evolutionary creation, then it will serve as positive evidence for theism that naturalism doesn't have, since naturalism makes no predictions about values or the distribution of evils. So rather than evil serving as evidence for naturalism, it actually serves as evidence for theism. You see, there is a difference between the problem of evil and the evidence of evil. The problem of evil can confirm or disconfirm theism depending on the value theory. The problem of evil, however, relies on certain value theories and uses the evidence of evil as evidence against theism. But if one's value theory is virtue ethics, then the problem of evil is dissolved. And in fact, given the value theory, the evidence of evil ends up as evidence for theism. Thus, given one's value assumptions about the fine-tuned range of the distribution of good and evil, it actually ends up favoring theism against naturalism, and so the evidence from evil has an opposite effect than naturalists intended. Of course, we need to get into the deeper question, which is about what kinds of evils is God morally justified in allowing? Well, answering this question leads straight into my biggest objection to any anti-theistic argument from evil. My objection is that the arguments from evil against theism implicitly assume the necessary condition criteria. What is this criteria? The necessary condition criteria rests on the normative belief that a morally good person always minimizes evil insofar as he or she can and will only authorize evil only when it is necessary to do so. As an example, authorizing an evil would be justified on the necessary condition if preventing the evil would cause something even worse, or would stop the forthcoming of a good that outweighs the evil. Thus, on this account, God can be only morally justified in authorizing evils that are absolutely necessary to bring about greater goods. My problem with this condition, however, is that it seems to enforce an ordinary human condition for allowing an evil on God. But there is no reason to think that this necessary condition applies to God, given our previous considerations on the value theory we are operating on. If one accepts the moral and value constraints stipulated by proponents of anti-theistic arguments from evil, then it makes sense why the necessary condition would apply to God. However, this is assuming a value theory that theists are free to reject. Instead of having God be bound by the necessary condition, God could be bound instead to what is called the defeat condition. On the defeat condition, God is authorized to allow evil as long as the evil is defeated within the total existence of whatever evil happens to a creature. An evil is defeated when it is integrated as a part of the valuable composite whole, and that the goodness of someone's life not only outweighs the evil in their life, but that the goodness they attain, such as virtues, cannot be valuable without the evil. A few good examples include the evil of sadness, which can be defeated by the, by the compassion that someone feels for a friend. There cannot be forgiveness without someone who is hurt. There cannot be courage without defeating the evil of fear. The defeat of evil happens all the time. In fact, the defeat condition is a logical consequence of the value theory we are operating on. Now, while it is true that we do not apply this defeat condition on humans, there is no reason why it cannot apply to God. God is not a human moral person. God is, by definition, an extraordinary moral person in a unique moral position. This makes it so that there is an aesthetic avenue open to God in a way that does not apply to non-God ethical agents. And so, on the defeat condition, God can be justified morally to authorize evils that are not necessary in an absolute sense, so long as God defeats the evils. The defeat of evils comes in the form of when virtuous creatures are developed through the suffering they go through. If we recall through the Law of Triumph, we see that as long as creatures experience evils that have no lasting damage and turn eventually into greater goods, that if the creatures so choose to allow it, then the law of triumph will take over, and this law of soul building would turn all the experienced instances of suffering into instrumental goods that shape and build each of us. So, the defeat condition allows it so that no, not every instance of evil is necessary, but rather, every instance of evil can be defeated if the person allows it. <laughs>
So arguments from evil all rely on the necessary condition criteria. But if we simply switch this condition with the defeat condition, then things get a little more interesting. If we replace the necessary condition with the defeat condition, then the problem of evil essentially vanishes. In fact, once we apply the defeat condition, then the only evils God can authorize are defeasible, are defeatable evils. And yet, defeasible evils are the only types of evils that we observe. So if God exists and is bound by the defeat condition, then the types of worlds that God creates are worlds where evils are defeated. And take it into account what we have said previously, if God must create the best kinds of worlds, and if under this value theory, the best kinds of worlds are with defeasible evils, then defeasible evils is evidence for theism. We can use this to make another argument for theism from defeasible evils. Premise 1. God is all good. Premise 2. If God is all good, then he would create the best kinds of worlds. Premise 3. The best kinds of worlds are worlds where the defeat condition of evil is met. Conclusion. Therefore, God will create a world where the defeat condition is met. Premise 5. If 4, then theism strongly predicts the defeat of evils. Premise 6. Therefore, the defeat of evils strongly predict is strongly predicted on theism. Premise 7. The defeat of evil is not strongly predicted on naturalism. Conclusion. Therefore, the defeat of evils is evidence in favor of theism against naturalism. With the defeat condition, it is guaranteed that God would create a world in which evil can be defeated. If that includes there being an afterlife that exists in this best kind of world, then this does not add into theism's content, but rather it is a logical consequence of God following his moral obligation to meet the defeat condition. And because of this, there is absolutely no evidence for indefeasible evils when we take into account the total existence of creatures as related to the afterlife and what theism entails. However, naturalism does not predict defeasible evils, since there is no upper or lower bounds on the types of evils that can exist on naturalism. On naturalism, there is a much brighter range for indefeasible evils to exist, since there doesn't need to be things like an afterlife, and there are no predictions on naturalism in regards to virtuous creatures. But since gratuitous evils are really just indefeasible evils, the naturalism does not lead us to expect the data of evil, and thus makes a wrong prediction. So every time that an evil is defeated, that would serve as positive evidence for theism given the defeat condition. But we do not th get these kind of predictions on naturalism. The defeat condition I have laid out undermines all of the anti-theistic arguments from evil. It specifically, especially, undermines the argument from inscrutable evils. As an example, take the paper written by the philosopher Robert Bass. Let's assume for the sake of argument that he is correct with his probabilistic independence. He argues that given the existence of many inscrutable evils, that even if we had a prior probability of 99% for theism, the existence of inscrutable evils would tip the scales against theism even with such a high prior probability. But his paper literally assumes the necessary condition criteria, and so does pretty much all the other philosophical papers written on the problem of evil that try to argue against theism. The necessary condition assumes that all evil must be necessary, but it seems that inscrutable evils are example of unnecessary evils, and thus God isn't justified in allowing them. Of course, this assumes that, ne that the necessary condition applies to God, but there is no reason to think that it should. If arguments from inscrutable evils is to succeed, it should try to show that these evils aren't able to be ultimately defeated, which means that the naturalist ought to show that within the theist resources, that theism cannot possibly come up with a story of how e such evils can be defeated. But obviously, this has not been done and cannot be done when we take into account that theism entails an afterlife. So. If we replace the necessary condition criteria with the defeat criteria, then the scales would tape in the opposite direction. One could take the argument from inscrutable evils and flip it. Remember, the defeat condition guarantees that theism strongly predicts defeatable evils. So put in a prior probability of 99% for naturalism, the fact that there exist many defeatable evils would tip the scales against naturalism even with such a high prior probability. And this is due to the fact that theism, which precludes naturalism, highly predicts the feasible evils. So using the defeat condition instead of the necessary condition not only solved the problem of evil, but it also turns the problem of evil into a problem for naturalism, and not a problem for theism.
With this in mind, I hope to have shown that theism does have great explanatory flexibility when it comes to explaining its anomalies like evil and divine hiddenness. I also want to make it clear that this makes for a viable theistic research project. As I explained earlier in this video, there may be other values that we have not totally seen as to why God allows evil and hiddenness. My theodicy is not meant as exhaustive. It is not meant to answer every single evil instance of the world. Rather, it is a general theodicy to show how theism has the resources to respond to the problem of evil regardless of what form it takes. The explanatory flexibility of theism comes from the versions of expanded theism that are not ad hoc. They are dynamic forms of theism that refine theism into its best and truest forms. And so, if the core claims of generic theism are true, and if the apex love of virtue is the case, then theism can be a viable research project. And it is not vain to hope that a theistic research project will, in the future, display an empirically and theoretically progressive character where it can illuminate us as to why God allows for evils. My theodicy is not perfect, but it can serve as a research project so that theism, as a grand theory for the world, can have ideal explanatory flexibility. Now, of course, many would still be unconvinced by this. How could evil possibly serve as evidence for theism? Isn't there other methodologies that we are having to ignore? For example, wouldn't these specific facts regarding evil serve as evidence for naturalism? And wouldn't specific facts about the world, when examined more closely, end up favoring naturalism? This objection is known as the fallacy of understated evidence, as termed by P Paul Draper. And wouldn't the comparative worldview method of Graham Oppy undermine theism in such a way as to whether naturalism is the best view to take? And so for that reason, I will address this objection and many others in my next video. And I will go over many atheological methods that attempt to undermine the theistic research project. But with that in mind, I hope to have shown that theism as a theory of the world does have ideal explanatory flexibility.